Good morning, it's me Dave Crane, hope you're feeling good, hope you're having a good day today, and if you haven't really started your day, at least you're out of bed, that's always a good thing. Very short intro today, because uh, I'm going to share with you uh, the latest episode of A Toilet Paper Diaries. Now, if you've never seen A Toilet Paper Diaries at all, or before, this is the one that started all off for me. Um, it was created about... Eight million years ago by my good friend Ernesto Verdugo and myself when we first went into lockdown about nine months ago. And uh, it was created as a daily show to help people be able to work through their challenges of being stuck in lockdown and not knowing what the world is going to be like next, as indeed we've all experienced. So with that, we set out to do about an hour every day and it's kind of progressed and now we're at episode 76. Now the reason I want to share episode 76 with you rather than anything else is because this show is all about the upcoming elections in about, woof, about a week or less than a week's time, we're going to find out who's going to be the leader of the, the Western world, which makes him probably the most powerful person in the world. Now, we don't talk about politics on the show. We've got our own particular leanings, but we do lean a little bit, not too much, for deliberate reasons, because we don't want to alienate anybody. I want to make sure that anybody can find the show as accessible as they can possibly, um, despite their misgivings or even if they're wrong about who they were going to vote for. And I know it's not all about America, it's about the world, but this does impact the world, to be honest with you. So this show, uh, we look at the advertising campaigns that were done by the current um, candidates for President of the United States, but also looking at the precedent, the precedent of what's happened years, going back almost 75 years, to see what Eisenhower was doing, what Clinton was doing, what Obama did, what Bush did, all these presidents all had a signature way of doing it, Reagan. Can you imagine what his advertising campaign was like and how he tapped into it? And there's a way and a methodology which I think will help you consider your business, especially if you watched yesterday's episode where it was all about your ability to um, punch above your weight. So if somebody else is the big one in the White House, effectively, in your business, and you want to start punching upwards, you have to start talking about change and the change that you're going to bring. If you're in the White House, effectively, in your business, what you have to do instead is you have to talk about the fact that you'll unify everybody because you're in that kind of position. So I hope that fascinates you, and I hope you enjoy the show. Um, different from our normal show. The next show we're going to share with you is all about the future of healthcare. I can promise you that's going to blow you away. It's a fascinating experience about how artificial intelligence, digitization, and uh, augmented reality are going to change the way that doctors and surgeons work, but also how telemedicine will mean that you might never see a doctor face-to-face -face again for a very long time, which is kind of good. And it should be a, a lot cheaper as well. That's coming up in the next show. But today, it's a Toilet Paper Diaries. So grab yourself a cup of coffee, chill out. And this is very hot. I've just burnt my hand trying to look cool. And enjoy the Toilet Paper Diaries. Cheers. Hi, welcome to the Toilet Paper Diaries. Today we're going to be looking at political advertising in history and what works and what doesn't work. Some campaigns work really well and some die horribly. And why? Another unique episode coming your way now with the Toilet Paper Diaries. Welcome to episode 76. So we took one week off and uh, obviously things went uh, crazy. So we have the uh, uh, second debate, which should have been the third debate. And uh, it was a little bit more orderly. Uh, then we have- boring. <laughs> It was boring. It wasn't orderly. It was just dull. And literally what you've got is you've got the two different debates, which in history will go down like with two candidates. One of them you can't control, won't stop abusing everybody, and it's in your face. And the other one is so in order and so well behaved, you should go back to watching Netflix instead. That will be the two candidates in the future when we look back at Biden versus Trump. Yeah, and then we have another interesting episode. I mean, we mentioned about uh, what happened with uh, Borat, that Borat was just about to get started. 
And suddenly we got the bombshell that uh, Rudy Giuliani was on it. So well, what do you think of that? the thing about Rudy Giuliani. Rudy Giuliani has been a source of great content forever. He started off as America's favorite mayor and then kind of threw his weight in behind Trump and everyone went, okay, wow. And then went a little bit more barking bonkers all the way through. But this has to be the cherry on the cake or the icing on his trousers, to be honest with you. Do you actually it, think that he had to actually fix his shirt <laughs> getting his hands and out inside of his, his it uh, pants? It doesn't matter. It doesn't <laughs> matter. The bottom line is that if you are a, in politics or in any kind of celebrity, you run the risk that you are going to get caught short by people who want to make money out of you or make you look stupid. Now, it, there's probably a completely innocent reason why Rudy Giuliani is upstairs with a potential um, right-wing news reporter and sticking his hand down the front of his pants after she's offered to take out his microphone. Ha <laughs> ha, microphone. Oh it my. might be completely fine, but maybe, like all guys, he's just readjusting himself and putting his shirt back in because the, the, the troops popped out of the barracks and we have to go back in again for him to be comfortable. But let's face it, <laughs> they, they've got a lot of being comfortable to do. So as to whether he was a naughty boy, or as to whether it was caught short, or as to whether there were ulterior motives, it doesn't really matter. It's all about the optics. And the optics were particularly good, but they were very funny. Yeah, they were very funny. And then also we had a DJ TJ launching his 2024 beef uh, to be president. So that's but Donald J. Trump Jr., for anybody who doesn't know who DJ TJ is, has decided, and he knew it anyway, we knew it anyway. It was actually a race between him and Ivanka as to who was going to de decide that they wanted to go first. Who's the oldest child? Ivanka. So I'm surprised that she hasn't run for it. Now, here's one of the things about that. Sorry to interrupt you. And I want to hear what you're going to say as well. I think if Ivanka started running for it, even if she just starts a campaign now, there'll be a ton of people who can't turn around and say bad things because they don't know enough about her. And she looks like Elsa out of Frozen. <laughs> yeah, that's correct. So, yeah, those are the crazy things. But I mean, right now we are one. Uh, do you have anything else? Uh, anything else that has happened in the week? Yeah, so the little things. We, we should really not forget the fact that Mike Pence's entire team seems to have contracted COVID oh and he's God. still out on the road and he's still going out and pressing the flesh and meeting people because he's got a deadline, literally, of uh, what at this stage of putting this out was about a week or so to go before the actual elections. So if you take your foot off the gas and you go into two weeks of quarantine, it's definitely the second in command has gone into hiding. They have no choice but to put him out there. But going out there at this time, knowing that he may well be infected, could easily have a backfire effect as he's pressing the flesh, not wearing a mask, and saying, vote Trump, vote Trump, vote Trump. We've got the coronavirus under control. Where's my team gone? Oh, we're all in hospital and quarantine. OK, yeah. but carry on. Shake my hand. Pull my finger. Not sure. <laughs> So, yeah, well, anyway, I mean, we are just uh, 10 days away from uh, the, the craziness. What's it going to happen? I mean, is it going to be a civil war or we're going to go crazy? We have no clue what we're actually seeing. But, of course, one of those things which are incredibly interesting to see are advertisements. And I think uh, if you are not into marketing, uh, but you're more, a little bit more into, into uh, politics, you're possibly going to be very surprised about what we're going to be learning right now on this episode of the Toilet Paper Diary. So, Dave, uh, we, in order for us to prepare for this episode, we were analyzing uh, advertising uh, all the way from uh, Eisenhower, didn't we? We went way back to the very, very beginning of where we could see TV ads, and we saw the evolution of how they changed and what worked and what didn't work. And I think that what you see is literally the spin doctors used to sell cornflakes, and they yeah. probably still do, who work on the campaigns. And so when you go back to the very beginning, you look at Eisenhower, you see an advert for Ike, which literally would rhyme with bike, because that's the kind of advert it is. Should we take a look? 
Ike for president, Ike for president, Ike for president, Ike for president. You like Ike, I like Ike, everybody likes Ike for president. Hang out the band and beat the drum, we'll take Ike to Washington. First of all, bear in mind that this 2020 election is going to be very different than the 2016 election. And every election, and this is what is going to be very interesting throughout this show, we're going to be showing to you uh, what was happening, because the most important thing that you need to understand is the sentiment of what is going on with the people, plus also who is actually doing the ad. So, uh, for example, in, 20, in the 2020 election, right now, uh, Donald Trump is the incumbent president, while in uh, 2016, he was the challenger, same as... Uh, uh, Hillary Clinton, however, the Democrats were in power. And what happened was that the tone of the advertisements were very, very different. Because normally what Dave and I realized was that uh, depending on exactly where they went, that's how they were doing their advertising. So possibly you can tell them a little bit of how that works, Dave. Yeah, it's very simple. If you're the defending president, then you want to make sure that you let everybody know you're doing a great job. But if you're challenging, then what you want to do basically and it's not just if you're challenging. If you're challenging and you're, you're losing, you want to shake it up. You want to say that everything is terrible. You need help. You need to get rid of this. We will lead you in a way forward where you'll get it all sorted out properly because it can't keep going on like this. Whereas if you are winning or you're incumbent and winning, which is even better, you say, we're going to unite everybody. We're just going to keep the love. God bless America and, and all who sail in her. And you have a, a, a calming attitude. So if you're challenging, you try and get them out. If you're staying where you are and winning, you say, let's just bring everyone closer together and we've got harmony. So you've got two completely different ways. And it's pretty much the way you do it if you were sitting on top of a hill and somebody's trying to knock you off it. You try and keep your balance on it if, you, if you're on top of a hill where somebody else is trying to push you with a big stick. And that's pretty much how the adverts have run all the way through when we researched them all the way back to Eisenhower. Exactly. And uh, so right now we can see, I mean, normally, if you want to see who's actually doing well in the campaign and how the campaign is, is uh, working, you can see what kind of advertising they are showing. So this is an advertising uh, that uh, started playing in uh, April 2020 for Donald Trump. And you can see what was the mentality at that specific point? Let's have a look. America is a land of heroes. A place where greatness is born, where destinies are forged, and where legends come to life. This is the home of Thomas Edison and Teddy Roosevelt, of many great generals, including Washington, Pershing, Patton, and MacArthur. This is the home of Abraham Lincoln, Frederick Douglass, Amelia Earhart, Harriet Tubman, the Wright brothers, Neil Armstrong, and so many more. This is the country where children learn names like Wyatt Earp, Davy Crockett, and Annie Oakley. This is the place where the Pilgrims landed at Plymouth and where Texas Patriots made their last stand at the Alamo. The American nation was carved out of the vast frontier by the toughest, strongest, fiercest, and most determined men and women ever to walk on the face of the earth. Our ancestors braved the unknown, tamed the wilderness, settled the Wild West, lifted millions from poverty, disease, and hunger, vanquished tyranny and fascism, ushered the world to new heights of science and medicine, laid down the railroads, dug out the canals, raised up the skyscrapers. Our ancestors built the most exceptional republic ever to exist in all of human history, and we are making it greater than ever before. This is our glorious and magnificent inheritance. We are Americans. We are pioneers. We are the pathfinders. We settled the new world. We built the modern world. And we changed history forever by embracing the eternal truth that everyone is made equal by the hand of Almighty God. 
America is the place where anything can happen. America is the place where anyone can rise. And here, on this land, on this soil, on this continent, the most incredible dreams come true. This nation is our canvas, and this country is our masterpiece. We look at tomorrow and see unlimited frontiers just waiting to be explored. Our brightest discoveries are not yet known. Our most thrilling stories are not yet told. Our grandest journeys are not yet made. The American age, the American epic, the American adventure has only just begun. Our spirit is still young. The sun is still rising. God's grace is still shining. And my fellow Americans, the best is yet to come. I've got to say, whatever your political views, and we do try and stay as neutral as we possibly can with this show, that's a beautiful ad. And if not for coronavirus, it would have been the, the unifying ad that America needed to see to put Trump as the statesman who just brings it all together and leads them in a direction that everybody seems to want to go. Correct. Coronavirus kind of hijacked it a little bit, though. Yeah. Enter uh, Joe Biden. And uh, now, of course... He is the challenger. So now he's in the position, I mean, uh, Trump is in the position of uniting everybody, but now comes the challenger, the challenger on this app. Have a look. Charlottesville, Virginia is home to the author of one of the great documents in human history. We know it by heart. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. We've heard it so often, it's almost a cliche, but it's who we are. We haven't always lived up to these ideals. Jefferson himself didn't, but we have never before walked away from them. Charlottesville is also home to a defining moment for this nation in the last few years. It was there on August of 2017, we saw Klansmen and white supremacists and neo-Nazis come out in the open. Their crazed faces, illuminated by torches, veins bulging and burying the fangs of racism, chanting the same anti-Semitic bile heard across Europe in the 30s. And they were met by a courageous group of Americans and a violent clash ensued. And a brave young woman lost her life. And that's when we heard the words of the President of the United States that stunned the world and shocked the conscience of this nation. He said there were, quote, some very fine people on both sides. Very fine people on both sides? With those words, the President of the United States assigned a moral equivalence between those spreading hate and those of the courage to stand against it. And in that moment, I knew the threat to this nation was unlike any I had ever seen in my lifetime. I wrote at the time that we're in the battle for the soul of this nation. Well, oh, that's even more true today. We are in the battle for the soul of this nation. I believe history will look back on four years of this president and all he embraces as an aberrant moment in time. But if we give Donald Trump eight years in the White House, he will forever and fundamentally alter the character of this nation, who we are. And I cannot stand by and watch that happen. The core values of this nation are standing in the world, our very democracy. Everything that has made America, America is at stake. That's why today I'm announcing my candidacy for president of the United States. Folks, America is an idea. An idea that's stronger than any army, bigger than any ocean, more powerful than any dictator or tyrant. It gives hope to the most desperate people on earth. It guarantees that everyone is treated with dignity and gives hate no safe harbor. It instills in every person in this country the belief that no matter where you start, 
in life. There's nothing you can't achieve if you work at it. That's what we believe. And above all else, that's what's at stake in this election. We can't forget what happened in Charlottesville. Even more important, we have to remember who we are. So there you've got Biden clearly shaking everything, not everything, but not like Rudolph Giuliani did earlier, um, but clearly shaking up the, the, the nest to say it's not working, it's a mess, this is the reason why, and then he will try and maneuver himself around to be the unifier because that's ultimately the message that he's been driving all the way through. But you can't throw the gauntlet down by saying that we're both unifying because nobody's going to buy into either of them. So that's kind of where he went like that. We can see here an advertising for Kennedy. And even though it's very musical and it is whatever, it is already using a number of different political views uh, on the app. Let's have a look. want a man for president who's seasoned through and through but not so doggone seasoned that he won't try something new a man who's old enough to know and young enough to do well it's up to you it's up to you it's strictly up to you do you like a man who answers straight a man who's always fair we'll measure him against the others and when you compare you cast your vote for kennedy and the change that's overdue so it's up to you it's up to you it's strictly up to you so the way that kennedy runs that kennedy ad runs is actually quite sophisticated it's animated but it's really well layered and even though it's in black and white and it looks a little bit ropey, you can see how much thought went into it using the latest technology in those days to be able to push him forward. I've got to remember that those two ads that you saw there are laughable nowadays, but those guys won by landslides on the back of that kind of advertising all those years ago. So it must have worked really well, but maybe what we need now is something a little bit different. So let's look at how things evolved since then. Well, I think it's important that we see what happened in the next election with uh, Lyndon Johnson. And this one actually implemented a new era of uh, advertising. And this is the first time that they started including fear. And uh, fear, uh, whoever he was uh, working on their campaign, he knew that fear was going to actually really get things going. Have a look. stakes to make a world in which all of God's children can live or to go into the dark. We must either love each other or we must die. Vote for President Johnson on November 3rd. The stakes are too high for you to stay home. So that's kind of scary. I've got to admit that um, that Daisy is probably how old now? She's probably too old to vote, I would guess. Uh, if she's still around with us. But that was a real fear campaign, driving all the nuclear war stuff. That obviously was really scary then. Oh, that's an interesting thing that's happened now. They've actually said that you're not allowed to do any more nuclear testing. So that wouldn't even work if we kind of use that kind of campaign right now. So the animation was just evolving at that time. It was turning into real people doing real stuff. And that was kind of arty for the time as well. Now, looking at the next one was Nixon, who wanted to uh, illustrate how his rival McGovern was going to change the defense plan. And it's a very simple advert. But if you look at this, notice the way that these toys are being moved around. And notice it's done by people wearing suits. You only see the sleeve and you only see the hand, but it illustrates exactly what was being done in terms of saying that the politicians are going to really bring down, not the politicians, the opposition politicians are going to really bring down the defense of our country. The McGovern Defense Plan. 
he would cut the Marines by one-third, the Air Force by one-third. He'd cut Navy personnel by one-fourth. He would cut interceptor planes by one-half, the Navy fleet by one-half, and carriers from 16 to 6. Senator Hubert Humphrey had this to say about the McGovern proposal. It isn't just cutting into the fat. It isn't just cutting into manpower. It's cutting into the very security of this country. President Nixon doesn't believe we should play games with our national security. He believes in a strong America to negotiate for peace from strength. So as you can see, I mean, it's very graphic, very easy, possibly was a very inexpensive act to make. However, I think uh, it was very effective for Nixon because what happened, Nixon obviously won <laughs> the election. So For a while anyway. For, for but... a while, yeah, exactly. But this is the important point. I mean, if we understand the sentiment of uh, how people are feeling, you can see what's going to be happening. And I think that's also really super important. Well, when you talk about it was a very inexpensive ad, I guarantee the ad company that put it together would have charged a fortune of taxpayers' <laughs> money to be able to get it to happen. And we know that he would have paid it because of who he was at the time. So, yeah. Well, it's mainly the idea. If you think about it, just mainly the idea. I mean, you're not paying for how much it costs uh, the, the, the labor, but you're actually, I mean, the idea is phenomenal. How, it, how uh, strong it is, the message. It's very, very good. Yeah. Let's move forward a little bit into uh, Ronald Reagan. I mean, we don't really, we didn't really find anything about Carter, uh, so it was uh, it was a, a little bit hard. But then we went into Reagan, actually the second uh, period in Reagan, and this one is very interesting. Why? Because uh, that story of MAGA make uh, make America great again. Everybody thinks that it's uh, Trump's idea, and in reality, it isn't. I mean, it has been used at least twice before, and, and the time that we can remember closest is uh, Ronald Reagan. Now, Ronald Reagan finished his first term, and then look at how, how he was positioning himself at this specific moment. And you can see exactly the pattern that we are talking about. If you are the uh, person which is winning the election, you always talk about uniting. If you are the challenging, then you go into the offense. Have a look. It's morning again in America. Today, more men and women will go to work than ever before in our country's history. With interest rates at about half the record highs of 1980, nearly 2,000 families today will buy new homes, more than at any time in the past four years. This afternoon, 6,500 young men and women will be married. And with inflation at less than half of what it was just four years ago, they can look forward with confidence to the future. It's morning again in America. And under the leadership of President Reagan, our country is prouder and stronger and better. Why would we ever want to return to where we were less than four short years ago? So there you go, the advert from Ronald Reagan, who came in as very successful, but he, like Trump, came from a different industry, wasn't necessarily a career politician, came in from outside. He was a Hollywood actor, and people didn't take him seriously, but he's looked back by many um, Republicans as the best of their best for being a presidential candidate. For many Democrats, I feel completely differently, and maybe the same will be said for Trump, going from business into politics, clearly not a politician, but as for presidential, we shall see. So let's move on now to Bill Clinton, who popped up uh, as a kind of JFK style character. And his message was always all about hope, telling his background, saying he's a, he's a good old boy that was there for everybody and uh, really being bipartisan, bringing everybody together in many ways. Take a look. I was born in a little town called Hope, Arkansas, three months after my father died. I remember that old two-story house where I lived with my grandparents. They had very limited incomes. It was in 1963 that I went to Washington and met President Kennedy at the Boys Nation program. 
And I remember just uh, thinking what an incredible country this was, that somebody like me, you know, had no money or anything, would be given the opportunity to meet the president. That's when I decided that I could really do public service because I cared so much about people. I worked my way through law school with part-time jobs, anything I could find. And after I graduated, I really didn't care about making a lot of money. I just wanted to go home and see if I could make a difference. We've worked hard in education and health care to create jobs, and we've made real progress. Now it's exhilarating to me to think that as president, I could help to change all our people's lives for the better and bring hope back to the American dream. You know, that's uh, very interesting because, uh, of course, I mean, you can see already a pattern of how uh, it goes back and forth in, in the, in the uh, advertising. Now, we didn't find any advertisings uh, from the time from Al Gore and uh, George W. Bush on the 2000 election. But uh, this one is the 2004 advertisings that they were running for uh, George W. Bush after 9-11 and after everything. You, you're going to see his uniting uh, message that, we, that he had. Have a look. These four years have brought moments I could not foresee and will not forget. I've learned firsthand that ordering Americans in the battle is the hardest decision, even when it is right. I have returned the salute of wounded soldiers who say they were just doing their job. I've held the children of the fallen who are told their dad or mom is a hero, but would rather just have their mom or dad. I've met with the parents and wives and husbands who have received a folded flag. And in those military families, I have seen the character of a great nation. Because of your service and sacrifice, we are defeating the terrorists where they live and plan, and you're making America safer. I will never relent in defending America, whatever it takes. I'm George W. Bush, and I approve this message. So there you got George W. Bush. And you've got to remember what happened was when he came in and won this time, he'd been through a Gulf War, he'd been through the 9-11 experience, and many people think he wouldn't get in again because of the fact of the, the so-called weapons of mass destruction and other things that we won't talk about. But he did. That unification message really worked. But then everything was up for grabs. So you didn't have him going in again for another term. He'd done his two terms. It had to be two new people. So the gloves were off. You had Barack Obama against John McCain. And Barack Obama took the uniting front. He took the uniting America, we can do this, yes, we can feeling. It was all about hope. And that message had a load of people jumping in, as always happens with the Democrats, lots of artists, creative people, hippies, um, joining in and have a look at this. You'll see exactly how it works. Nothing can stand in the way of the power of millions of voices calling for change. We have been told we cannot do this by a course of sentence. It they will only grow only louder, louder and more disciplined. We've been asked to pause for a reality check. We've been warned against offering the people of this nation false hope. But in the, but in the unlikely story, story that is America, there's, there's never, never been, been anything, anything false about hope. hope. The little girl who grows in the public school in the village are the same as the dreams of boy who learns on the streets of L.A. We will remember that there's something happening in America. That we are not as divided as our politics suggest. That we are one people. That we are one nation. And together, we will begin the next great chapter in the American story with three words that will ring from coast to coast, from sea to shining sea. Yes, we can. 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 Yes, we can.
So there you go. I mean, this is one of my absolutely favorite uh, campaigns of all time. And once again, this started with uh, the story of hope, which we have seen that Bill Clinton have used again. And uh, also we saw that uh, Donald Trump is using MAGA, Make America Great Again, but that's not his slogan. That was actually used by another previous Republican, which in this case was uh, Reagan. So as we can see, it is just a circulation of messages. You can't say that, Ernesto. You can't tell the people who are voting for Trump right now it wasn't his slogan. They won't believe you. Well, it's I mean, true. we have, I mean, there's enough evidence. I mean, right now you can see some evidence here in front of you that there is, that this is not his slogan. This actually, it is Ronald Reagan's slogan. I mean, Fake what news. do you want me to say? Fake, <laughs> Fake news. news. <laughs> yeah, the Democrat campaign to take it down about Donald Trump. He invented it, and from the very beginning, people just had to get him, and you should know better. Unfortunately, and, that is not the true. I'm actually reporting the exact news, and this is exactly <laughs> what is going on. <laughs> we don't write it, we just share it, that's all. That is so what happened then? I mean, after that, Obama was quite successful in his first term, in the fact that um, he, he was back up again, uh, but this time he's running against uh, a more challenging, well, Mitt Romney, see how you want to. Yeah, well, this one is actually very interesting because the approach is super presidential. It's uh, very uh, nicely orchestrated. And look at the message. Actually, we have this, uh, this ad that where he's talking directly to the people. And this is the first time that I see a message which is not using imagery but he's actually using the president himself talking to the people. Have a look. During the last weeks of this campaign, there will be debates, speeches, and more ads. But if I could sit down with you in your living room or around the kitchen table, here's what I'd say. When I took office, we were losing nearly 800,000 jobs a month and were mired in Iraq. Today, I believe that as a nation, we are moving forward again. But we have much more to do to get folks back to work and make the middle class secure again. Now, Governor Romney believes that with even bigger tax cuts for the wealthy and fewer regulations on Wall Street, all of us will prosper. In other words, he doubled down on the same trickle-down policies that led to the crisis in the first place. So what's my plan? First, we create a million new manufacturing jobs and help businesses double their exports, give tax breaks to companies that invest in America, not that ship jobs overseas. Second, we cut our oil imports in half and produce more American-made energy oil, clean coal, natural gas, and new resources like wind, solar, and biofuels, all while doubling the fuel efficiency of cars and trucks. Third, we ensure that we maintain the best workforce in the world by preparing 100,000 additional math and science teachers, training 2 million Americans with the job skills they need at our community colleges, cutting the growth of tuition in half, and expanding student aid so more Americans can afford it. Fourth, a balanced plan to reduce our deficit by $4 trillion over the next decade. On top of the trillion in spending we've already cut, I'd ask the wealthy to pay a little more. And as we end the war in Afghanistan, let's apply half the savings to pay down our debt and use the rest for some nation building right here at home. It's time for a new economic patriotism, rooted in the belief that growing our economy begins with a strong, thriving middle class. Read my plan, compare it to Governor Romney's, and decide for yourself. Thanks for listening. So there you go. You see, it managed to work out for two terms for Obama, and then you're back to square one again in 2016. And in fact, you've got two new challenges, and who's going to take the center ground? Now, one of the things that in hindsight was quite clear, but at the time the world wasn't ready for, was the, the positioning that Hillary Clinton took against Trump. She talked about the deplorables. She talked about the naming and shaming of all the embarrassing things he did. This guy doesn't care about women. This guy doesn't care about race. This guy doesn't care about all these different things. And what was very clear by the fact that she lost in the end was that none of his fans cared about those things either. And that's ultimately how it all played out. It was a campaign that was meant to make him look bad, but his people don't care. Even now, looking back in it, 
almost four years later, you can see how that was doomed to fail because while everyone else goes tut, 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 his guys go, yeah, that's Trump. Yeah, that's one of the things that you need to understand. Uh, that's why, I mean, this is very psychological. And because of course, there's so many feelings involved into uh, every campaign, you really need to know exactly what you're doing. So for example, on this, uh, on this video, we are going to see the response from uh, Donald Trump against Hillary Clinton talking about the deplorables. Have a look. Speaking to wealthy donors, Hillary Clinton called tens of millions of Americans deplorable. You could put half of Trump supporters into what I call the basket of deplorables. The racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, Islamophobic, you name it. People like you, you, and you, deplorable. You know what's deplorable? Hillary Clinton viciously demonizing hardworking people like you. I'm Donald Trump, and I approve this message. Therefore, you've got Donald Trump against Hillary Clinton. And when she talks about the deplorables, it kind of backfires because those people that she says he has as his supporters become even more embedded and empowered as his supporters because Hillary Clinton, who they don't like, has just said that she doesn't like them, so they're going to love Trump even more. And we've seen that for the last four years. Instead, what she was hoping to do to continue that theme was to say that ultimately Trump is not a great role model for your kids, which kind of everybody knew. And so it didn't work for her quite as well as she wanted to. Have a look at this advert. This is exactly what we are talking about. I mean, if you're using the wrong ad in the wrong time, the results are going to be terrible. So right now, Hillary was ahead. In the polls, she was always ahead. She was always supposed to be the winner. But instead of actually having advertisings and doing advertisings of how to unite the United States and that she was going to be a president for everybody, et cetera, et cetera, what is what she does? She goes into the attack and does an advertising uh, like this. And of course, that completely backfires because, of course, what happened was that she, she just uh, make herself vulnerable into whatever attack uh, um, uh, Trump uh, was going to be doing. I mean, you know very well that Trump, all he does is always saying, well, you know, they're treating me unfairly and, uh, uh, you know, lock her up and all these kinds of things. And because, of course, her not doing the united, the uniting the, the country kind of strategy, she completely messed up. It's interesting how all these things work, no, Dave? One of the things that, yeah, that I think is fascinating about that and we know it from our experience of doing stuff on the internet now with our wisdom, is if you turn around and you say nasty things about somebody else, people start thinking that you're nasty as well, even if what you said about the other person is true. And so you ended up in a really strange situation with the last elections, um, with Trump versus Clinton, where people were voting for the person that they disliked less than the other person. Many people didn't like either of the candidates who didn't bother voting at all, but some people just decided that they didn't like what Clinton represented, and Trump at least was some fresh of, a breath of fresh air, which, let's face it, in hindsight, he was and is, um, for whatever we want to smell of that fresh air. Anyway, that's not very neutral, is it? I shouldn't say that. Anyway, it's come out. Um, so what she did by pushing the same game as Trump he was always going to beat her because he didn't care what she thought of him. He will always win that battle against almost anybody. Yeah, you know what my favorite example is, uh, how uh, Joe, uh, Joe Biden has now used uh, an, an interview with Lindsey Graham talking wonders about uh, Joe Biden and uh, how it suddenly now came to bite him <laughs> because of what's happened. Well, this that, is, that is what I find hilarious in politics. <laughs> this is one of the things, be careful what you say, it will come back to haunt you. So Lindsey Graham is probably going to go down in history as the most flip floppy politician that most people have ever seen, where he says, hold the tape, I'm standing by this, we will never put somebody in as a uh, member of a judiciary, if there's a, a president that's just due to come in, and then he turns around and goes, yeah, whatever, afterwards. So now what he said about Donald, Donald Trump has all been flipped around. He yeah. said these things about Biden, these things about Trump, and it's a gift to the Biden campaign to turn around and say, look what his best friends have always said. Yeah, have a look at this ad. 
Well, I want to talk to the Trump supporters for a minute. What is Donald Trump's campaign about? He's a race-baiting, xenophobic, religious bigot. And you know how you make America great again? Tell Donald Trump to go to hell. If you can't admire Joe Biden as a person, then it's probably, you got a problem. <laughs> you need to do some self-evaluation. Because what's not to like? He is as good a man as God ever created. He said some of the most incredibly heartfelt things that anybody could ever say to me. He's the nicest person I think I've ever met in politics. This is a defining moment in the future of the Republican Party. We have to reject this demagoguery, and if we don't reject Donald Trump, we've lost the moral authority, in my view, to govern this great nation. So that brings us up to speed with 2020. As we speak, there's about a week or so to go towards the elections. Now, there's a couple of factors that we've got to consider. First of all, we've seen four years of Donald Trump being a complete master of manipulating fake news, creating um, photo opportunities, creating news to deflect from other stuff that you would be looking at, misdirection, uh, fear, saying poor me and saying he's always victimized and people go, well, was he victimized? And the minute they start doubting it, the minute is when he starts winning. But what we've seen now is a massive challenge based on the fact that we're running out of time for him to turn it around. Biden and all the polls, not all the polls, but many of the polls, says that he's got enough to be able to win. So Trump has to be able to throw a ton of money at advertising and also change the narrative to make people start buying into his vision again. Now, there's two problems here. First of all, it looks like the Trump campaign has been dwarfed for the amount of money available for going head to head with Biden to the point where I think you were saying you were watching a couple of days ago. Was it the Super Bowl or the World Series? The World Series. Yeah, it was, a, it, it was the World Series. And uh, once again, we have to see uh, what is the message that they are uh, that they are actually getting on. Because uh, one of the things that we can see while all the advertising that we studied and, and, and saw throughout the, the years, it was that uh, every campaign was very neatly organized and they have a specific message. Right now, the challenge is, I mean, make America great again, again. And we have seen Trump actually mentioning this a few times, make America great again, again. But the problem is he has, he's right now not the uh, challenger, but he's actually the incumbent. So that is that just creates an issue. Now, the reason why they are going out of uh, cash and uh, whatever it is, because, of course, they have not really managed the campaign very well. And this is what is extremely, extremely costly for him. Now they are also having uh, problems in advertising on the Internet, like on YouTube and in uh, Facebook, because they are using they are trying to defend themselves with stuff that possibly is not uh, real. And uh, this, I think, it's very interesting for you to have a look. President Trump has been advertising a lot on YouTube lately. Have you uh, taken down any of President Trump's ads at all? There are ads of President Trump that were not approved to run on Google or YouTube. Do you have an example? Well, they're available in our transparency report. Kind of. Google keeps an archive of political ads. And we looked at President Trump's ads. Over 300 videos were taken down, mostly over the summer. But the archive doesn't detail what rules they violated. There's no transparency in the transparency report. The ads typically did run for a few days before they were taken down, and Google got paid for them. So there you see a ton of ads have been pulled from the Trump campaign, which makes it harder and harder to get your message out if it's just not reaching people. Even if it goes up for a couple of days, it's not getting a longevity. Now, we talked on a previous episode about the big debate, the first debate of Trump versus Biden. And we said that what we thought Biden would do, because he couldn't really go head to head with Trump, who's just brilliant at holding an audience and scoring points nonstop, that he was going to do a rope-a-dope like Muhammad Ali in the Rumble in the Bronx, when he's up against George Foreman, much bigger hitter. And so he went up against the ropes, held himself in, and let Foreman keep punching until eventually his arms were tired, and then he picked him off, bang, bang. I think that what we've got is Biden allowed Trump to go crazy, go out there, tell everybody all this stuff, which he's brilliant at doing, but then waited for that moment when he let his guard down by just saying one thing, that was gonna come back and bite him. And I think that this advert, 10 seconds worth of it, 
is worth its weight in gold. And you've got to pull, hold your hands up and say, you couldn't buy this kind of advertising. Take a look at this. If I lose to him, I don't know what I'm going to do. I will never speak to you again. You'll never see me again. I'm Joe Biden, and I approve this message. I mean, on the World Series, this is something that is being watched by a ton of Americans. And uh, look at the advertising that was uh, put together by um, Joe Biden. Have a look. There is only one America. No Democratic rivers. No Republican mountains. Just this great land and all that's possible on it with a fresh start. Cures we can find. Futures we can shape. Work to reward. Dignity to protect. There is so much we can do if we choose to take on problems and not each other and choose a president who brings out our best. Joe Biden doesn't need everyone in this country to always agree. Just to agree, we all love this country and go from there. I'm Joe Biden and I approve this message. So one of the things that's really strange about this particular campaign is the Lincoln Project, where a ton of Republicans just don't like Trump because Trump is now the name of the party. And so um, led by George Conway and many others, they know exactly how things should come together for a Republican campaign. And so they've been planning that and doing independent ads to take down Trump on behalf of Biden, so they can get a brand new Republican party that can move forward in the future. So there's still Republicans fighting the Republican party on behalf of Joe Biden, just to do a clear out. Now, what's interesting about this is the amount of adverts that they've popped out and they haven't been in a position where you can blame them for playing dirty games because they're not allied to any particular party. They're independent, they're in the middle. They just wanna make one statement, which is that they want to get Trump out. So this is a fascinating one, all about the relationship um, created with the armed forces. And they, by Trump saying that they were losers in some interview that he did, they've taken that, made a very simple advert with a very simple but proper use of um, campaign throughout the entire elections. Take a look at this. Losers. Suckers. Dopes. Babies. That's how Donald Trump describes our men and women in uniform. Even Fox News confirms he said it. An American president would know our troops are defined by words like courage, honor, integrity, strength, patriotism, valor, and for so many, sacrifice. He's a draft dodger in chief who despises the men and women he supposedly leads. He insults their deaths and injuries with his contempt. He looks down on them for serving this nation, mocking them because there's no money in it. Millions of Americans have served and sacrificed. Millions more have sent a family member off to war. Only Donald Trump mocks their deaths because Donald Trump is simply un-American. The Lincoln Project is responsible for the content of this advertising. The uh, Lincoln Project is actually using the exact same strategies that the Republicans have used in the past against them themselves. Now, what is very interesting, and that's another element that we have not spoken too much about it, because there's so many different advertisings, they are now using specific a specific demographic. So, for example, they are doing some advertisings which are appealing to, to the uh, black population. They are doing some advertising which are appealing to uh, a number of different, uh, to the old people, to the younger people, and uh, and whatever. And I think it's uh, it's very very clever the way that they're doing it. And this is a point that I want to also talk about. And Dave, I think this is just uh, something which I think we are experiencing right now. 
I mean, it is clear that uh, the overall sentiment is that, uh, you know, there's a dissatisfaction with uh, Donald Trump. However, that doesn't mean that there's dissatisfaction with the Republicans. And this is exactly the whole thing. I mean, I think uh, if you are talking about the uh, Republican ideology or if you're talking about the uh, Democrat ideology, that's one thing. But then Trumpism is a completely different story. And that's what we also need to, to really uh, understand because, of course, it's more than anything party over country. And some people think country over party. Am I right? I think so. And I think what they're doing there is planting a very clever seed for getting Biden in and getting Biden out, because the Republican Party has been a Trump party with lots of people going against their principles in order to stay in power. That much has been very clear by the silence that comes when things are very controversial and people go and ask Republican politicians, what do you think? They don't say anything or they just make up a different conversation. I think that the clever part of what the Lincoln Project's doing is it's planting a seed to say in four years' time, if, if, if Biden wins, we police our own. We are a Republican Party. We put America first. Even if it means cleaning out our system, we've always had your back. And that is like a get-out-of-jail card for the Republican Party to come back like a phoenix again if that's where they want to be, if Biden wins and Trump is out. There's not only the Lincoln Project, there's a number of different groups which are Republicans against Trump. And uh, this is an advertising, which I think it's very, it's uh, also very low budget, but incredibly powerful. It's called Vote. And uh, they are playing it all over the United States. And uh, that is through small donations from uh, smaller groups. Have a look. So there we go. You may hate it, you may love it, but soon we'll be rid of it. I can't wait for a time, Ernesto, when we do a show and we don't have to care about the politics anymore. We just talk about things around the world that amuse us, or maybe talk about that pandemic thing that kind of hijacked the entire world for a whole year. Now, whatever happens, we know the best man will win or the best man will cheat or whatever it will happen, we'll end up in about two weeks time being able to say this is what's going to be America for the next four years. But when people look back at it, what are they going to remember? Are they going to remember the campaigning? Are they going to remember the nasty fighting? Or are they just going to say it was a load of utter gibberish? In my opinion, bad lip reading are the best people to summarize the entire election campaign when they did their version of the first hot debate of Trump against Biden. This will make more sense in the future than it did right now. Take a look. You know, in the 90s, he called the pagers stupid pagers. Yeah, and he did. Said it I all said the time. that. He said stupid they're pagers. Just not he good. said that. I would never say that because someone could blah. hear. 
they were simple. <laughs> One whiskey. So Dave, can you believe now we have done 76 episodes? We have been in uh, lockdown or at least uh, semi-lockdown for almost eight months. We are ready to go into the elections and we're still here. <laughs> I've got to admit, I did think that at some point people were going to turn on the show and we'd see both of us dangling by our necks outside our own windows because we'd just had enough of lockdown, enough of toilet paper diaries, enough of all the politics as well. But no, we continue from strength to strength. And there's a very good chance that the toilet paper diaries will continue longer than one person's career. Except we don't know who that person is going to be. We do not somebody, know. somebody will hang up their wig or they'll hang up their tie or they'll hang themselves in about a week and a bit's time. We'll be back there. We'll be ready to point our fingers and we'll be there to share all the laughs and all the truths and a few bits of fake news and misinformation as always with the toilet paper diaries. It's what we do. Yeah.